Dear guests, is this too loud? Is it just right? Okay. My name is Katarina Haig. I'm the Vice President of External Relations at the Stockholm School of Economics. And it is my pleasure to welcome you to this seminar tonight, which is a cooperation between the Foundation Marketing Technology Center and the Stockholm School of Economics. Now, as participants here tonight, you have all or you will receive a copy of this book, Managing Digital Transformation. It features research and findings by 27 researchers from different institutions, many of whom are here as speakers tonight. And it's a book that I would like to highly recommend. I am, as all of you, um, every day trying to keep up with the challenges, the possibilities presented to us by digitalization. And as responsible for external relations here at SSE, I work in the field of marketing and communications. And my colleagues and I are always trying to find new ways to navigate, to innovate in the landscape of audiences, influencers, uh, communication channels. It's constantly changing. We can also clearly, clearly see how power and initiatives are moving away from institutions to people to the users, the takers of our services. And we find that it is often them who push us to become more innovative. Uh, they drive us towards innovation. Now, one of my favorite parts, many favorite parts in this book, um, can be found in chapter 11, which is written by professors Lars Gunnar Mattsson and Per Andersson, who, is all, who will also speak here tonight. Um, they present a wonderful case of exactly that, how a driven and innovative customer pushes a corporate partner to rethink their business model entirely with the help of digitalization. It's a case set in a research context about appliance company Philips, you know Philips, and how they actually managed to move from providing low interest product lamps to a high interest service light and how this transformation also moves them to establish a whole new ecosystem based on sustainability it's highly inspirational and very instructive as things usually are at the stockholm school of economics <laughs> and as they will be tonight and on that note, I would like to hand over to one of my colleagues and one of the moderators for this evening, Professor Magnus Maring, who will guide you through what has been researched on in digitalization at SSE. Magnus. Thank you very much, Katrina. <laughs> Good evening. Great to see you here. Uh, there is supposed to be um, there is supposed to be uh, um, an expert here who will do this or this if I speak too loudly or too, or not loudly enough. I think this is a little bit too loud, right? Better like this? Okay, perfect. Good. Thank you. Uh, great to see you here. Terrific uh, to see many new friends and some old friends as well. Um, I thought I'd start with saying a few words about SEC for those of you who are new to the building or haven't been here for a while. Um, uh, the Stockholm School of Economics is, um, um, sorry, I, I'm going to have to moderate this because it echoes in my head. It might be a sign that there is too little going on inside, but <laughs> <laughs> nevertheless, I have to adjust. Um, um, a few words about SEC. Very small school, very international school, um, the top ranked business school in, in the Nordics. Um, if you have um, experience from SSC that date a few years back, this is an entirely different place almost. Um, we've kept all the good things and we've made a lot of the other things much, much better. Um, it's really a, a, a very, very international school. All the master programs are in English, all the, the PhD programs are in English. We're internationalizing our uh, bachelor programs. Um, if, you look, if you meet the faculty, there are more international uh, members of the faculty. Uh, the 
place is very vibrant, also thanks to the fact that we have um, a building now which is much more um, uh, conducive to meetings. And meetings, of course, is a central part of what makes a good business school. It's not about the books, it's about the people, right? So, um, um, we also have a very broad range of programs, and uh, not only a broad range of executive education programs, but also a range of master programs in vari with sp various specializations. Um, many ways for students and participants in programs to find their own niche and find their own profile. Um, what we do is very much about also creating personal experience. That's one of the benefits of being a small school. Uh, that goes also not only for the students, but also for us as scholars, uh, also for the corporate partners that we work with. Um, that also means that a lot of stuff is taking place in the school without a central authority telling people what to do. That's of course what an acad academic institution is about, but it's also very much uh, the hallmark, you could say, of a small and relatively entrepreneurial institution. Um, that also means that when we started this book project, which Stefan will tell you more about, we were rather quickly very amazed about the range of topics uh, being researched already at SSC on digitalization. So we'll give you a little bit of a tasting menu on that tonight, but uh, and I'd say this is the tasting menu really, because this is not all the stuff we're doing. This is some of the stuff we're doing on digitalization, which is kind of cool. Uh, so a lot of this has to do with building a strong network for us to be able to do uh, interesting research. But uh, what we also decided recently is to build an even stronger core in terms of research, teaching, and dialogue on innovation, digitalization, and entrepreneurship. So we're shaping a new department uh, with this particular focus. Uh, we already have a master program with uh, a business venturing innovation focus. And uh, we look forward to doing a lot more uh, of research in this area. So uh, um, what we're doing tonight is sort of for us is partly telling you, telling you about the stuff we have been doing and that we happen to be doing right now but for us, it's also part of a dialogue looking forward to new things we'll, we'll be doing. Uh, also with new funding from, um, uh, for, for a uh, Jakob and Marcus Wallenberg Center, uh, which has a professorship held by Sarah Jack, um, uh, recently hired, uh, um, an upcoming Scania Center on Innovation. So there's, there's never enough money to do all the interesting things we want to do, but there is at least some resources for us to do new and cool things. Uh, so what we want to create is a very much an academic meeting place and a hub for knowledge development in the broad area of innovation, digitalization, entrepreneurship. And we, of course, invite you to be part of that. Um, well, lots of things to talk about, lots of things to offer, lots of things that we're planning, so please stay tuned and stay in touch as we go through the evening and beyond. Um, I'll hand over to you, Stefan, for more about the tasting menu. Absolutely. Great. Thank you, Magnus. <laughs> I, I'd just like to introduce myself. My name is Stefan Movin, and I'm uh, Managing Director of uh, Stiftelsen Magnus Technic Centrum, a foundation uh, bringing academia and business together. And before I go on and describing about the book, I would like you to look at, uh, to bring up your phones and make sure that you are connected to the internet because we're going to have an interactive dialogue throughout the session with you tonight. And this is the only slide where you can see the uh, username and the password on. So you need to be able to log on to, to the internet unless you have a cell phone with other connections. It's, uh, uh, I guess it's HHS guest. Guest. The upcoming of, of the book is uh, MTC Marketing Technology Foundation is bridging academia and business together, and we've been uh, we were part of several uh, 
uh, research projects and in discussions with several companies about the challenges facing companies in their transformation, digital transformation. And part of that made that it was quite interesting to see what could we do and how can we make sure that we are learning and moving faster in the digital transformation. Because some of the research found notice that it, we are in fact not moving fast enough. It's we have great digital knowledge, we have great uh, acceptance of digital solutions, but still corporations, businesses, organizations are not moving fast enough. So that was the origin why we thought we could do something about it. And that it was uh, also the foundation or the building block why we started to do in this project of not only looking what is out there, what is being done in the research area, but also uh, bringing up and making a couple of cases that could be used in executive education and as a learning tool for businesses to develop faster. So part of this project that is financed by Venova has also been to, uh, to uh, establish cases that it could help you to move faster, in fact. And what you're seeing here going around is, in fact, the smorgasbord, the number of the researchers and the, the titles of the chapters. And as said, when you leave in the, in the wardrobe, you will get this uh, book. And the interesting part is when you start opening the closet and when, you, when you're seeing what kind of ideas is going out there, there's a lot of new intentions and new ideas that are really prospering or uh, growing all over the area when it comes to digitalization. And we are focused, this book is going from the broad, broad perspective, what is digitalization, the platforms behind it, to, and through the ecosystems into the organization and seeing the internal perspectives as well. So we have a really broad range of different solutions and different aspects of digitalization that I didn't think about from the beginning but it is really good that it's brought up. And we end also with a future outlook, what is happening next. And in order for that future outlook to, to, um, uh, to in, instead of using the book uh, structure, we are turning it the other way around in this place. So we are gonna, we're gonna start with the future outlook in this presentation for you. And we're gonna start with Robin. But before that, I would like to introduce Magnus, Pat, and Robin, stand up. Uh, they will be the moderators for this session. Uh, they will, because we are going to use men, uh, mentimeter technique, so we will uh, ask you guys with direct questions, and you will answer uh, those questions, and we will have an interactive discussion based on uh, five different um, uh, in spill or uh, small, small part discussions that we are uh, entering and then you will have an interactive discussion. And uh, if we start the, the Mentimeter question, we can just make sure that you know how it works as well. Yeah, that going to warm up because then we will just, you will get, go into menti.com on your iPhone or your smartphone or computer, menti.com, and there you will get in a very short while a number that is this session, and then we can start answering the first question. Menti.com, and the code is 3821. 69 and then you just enter what kind of organization you represent so we can see that it works so this is uh, the way you're going to work and we're going to ask you questions throughout the session, but until then, uh, Robin, please. Thank you. Again, I'd like to thank you for your work. Let's do this. I get a 
this one. Let's see. Right on? Okay. Well, we do this somehow. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Robin Peglin. I'm a professor here in the Department of Marketing and Strategy. And originally from the US, I've been here for 25 years now and fascinated by the future. But as a researcher, that's really difficult because how can we research the future? We as researchers, we look in the mirror, the rear view mirror to see where have we been and how can we make sense of what we've seen to enable us to move into the future. But yet so many of us know, as we see today, we're now into, in an era of exponential change. So in terms of strategy, if we're looking forward, how do we make strategic decisions based on the knowledge of what we know about the past? Because a lot of what's going to happen in the future, we don't even know what we don't know. And that's why I'm fascinated by emerging technologies, such as the blockchain, such as artificial intelligence, 3D printing, cryptocurrencies, et cetera. There's so many. And, and actually, what even more is it was more interesting is what happens when these converge? What happens when you have token-enabled, decentralized, autonomous organizations that are enabling people to, say, 3D print things, say, pieces of your body somewhere else in some other part of the world, and it's not even an organization? How do you, how do you understand this? As a government, how do you actually tax this, some type of organization that's not an organization? These are the questions that I'm trying to understand. And uh, one of the things that I thought we could do today is think about a little bit about in the future. Let's think about the year 2030. What type of confidences do you think we need in Sweden to retain our position as a leading country, say, in terms of innovation, in terms of entrepreneurship? Be thinking about that, because that will be one of the Mentimeter. Oh, it's already up there. It's already up there. So you can actually all be thinking about that. What is that? And there's so many people looking at say these different waves automation, for example, we have a report that just came out on that. And one of the things, there's also you know, a lot of consulting companies looking, there's a lot of people trying to understand moving into the future. And I just read a report that was just uh, recently put out by PwC, talking about three different waves of automation, where the first wave is the algorithm wave, which is firstly happening between now and 2020 or so. And our idea is that what we'll see being replaced is what we call cognitive routine tasks. The things that you do every day that some type of service or, you know, somebody, if you think about customer service or checking in at a hotel, kind of a cognitive task. So what we'll be seeing, this is kind of the, the algorithm wave. Then there's another wave coming along. And here the idea is that what will be replaced is actually physical, manual routine tasks. So it's the augmentation wave. How will we augment what we do with our body? So this is where we see autonomous cars coming in. Sorry, but we're augmenting what we're doing physically. The third wave is about autonomy, and that's what I'm really trying to understand. These organizations decentralized. We have flash organizations where artificial intelligence can go out and source people on these freelance platforms, pay them with tokens, then maybe paying one another, but there's no central authority, no central organization. This is where non-routine cognitive and non-routine manual tasks start getting replaced. What will the future look like? How, what will confidences will we need in the future like this? So take a few minutes, speak with your partner or speak with the person next to you. Actually speak with someone who you don't know, okay? So try to find someone next, you know, either behind you, next to you, who you don't know, because quite often we speak to people we already know. Talk about this question for a few minutes, please.
a great discussion. Wow, is it? Woo. <laughs> Time out. Don't forget to add your answers. Put in your answers to the Mentimeter. Who would like to uh, share with us while people are putting into the Mentimeter what you were discussing? What do you think? Who would like to share with us? And please, I've, I'm, I'm collecting data from you now, please. Uh, I'm actually on a few different uh, groups uh, where we're actually trying to, we're looking into this question. So all this is actually very good input for me. So please input your answers. So who would like to start us off? Go ahead, please. And so, if you could say your name and where you're from, please, that'd be great. Mm -hmm. Philosophy and creativity. Can you explain why? What do you think, philosophy? So if there was a philosophical question, kind of a sense of purpose in a way, like what, yeah, what is the meaning and, and, and then the creativity to enable you to actually, okay. ah, great philosophy, creativity, anyone else? Yes, please, and say your name, where you're from, please. Uh, I like that. Okay, this is great input. So actually, I think it's very important being able to see exactly things from different perspectives. Understand because we all attack problems in a different way. And the other one thing I think that a lot of people are talking about is we talk about, you know, attacking the problem. I think here, especially with the ability with, you know, where you can get online and reach anybody anywhere in the world, the solution is probably out there to the problem. It's about putting the pieces together. I think it is a bit of a, you know, mind shift of going from being a problem solver to a solution finder. But in order to be able to do that, you have to actually look at the problem from different perspectives and use creativity to find, you know, the different ways of how might we put the pieces together to actually arrive at some type of solution. Great input. Love this. Okay. So this is actually one question is like, what are the competences we need? And if I think about this, where's Carl sitting? One of my students. Yes. What's so important for me is to make sure that Sweden has the competencies to actually you know, as I mentioned earlier, to retain its competitive position, become, continue to be innovative, have this entrepreneurial spirit, et cetera. So Carl and I was just in my office and I'm like so pumped up after speaking with him. Carl was one of my students a year and a half ago in the course that I teach was strategic thinking in a complex and digital world. And we talked about the blockchain a year and a half ago. So now Carl has actually started an organ, has part, joined a startup uh, within the blockchain space He's creating a WordPress for the blockchain. Is that correct? That's correct. Okay. Now, when he's in my office, he's talking about DAOs, he's talking about DApps, he's talking about tokens, about cryptocurrency, et cetera. Where did the, how did he learn this? What type of formal training has there been in Sweden to enable people who are in this space to learn this? It's actually all been quite informal through this. So that makes me as a teacher, as a, you know, a very you know, per person in, in Sweden thinking about competitiveness, how do we ensure that Sweden is actually able to produce people with this competence, the competences that we need? So that's actually the next question. We can just put in real quick, uh, which is what do you think? How do you think Sweden, what can Sweden do? How can we ensure, what recommendations do you have to ensure that Sweden handles these waves and these new technologies that are coming along. So just put in for a couple, uh, for one minute. And this you actually just think on your own. It's actually important to think individually as well. I'll give you one minute. It's a tough, because I think my time is up. Is that correct? <coughs> Where's the moderate? Where's the cell phone? My time's up, right? Yeah. Uh, don't get a researcher talking about their research. <laughs> so just put in a couple minutes. And I'll just make all of these um, results available later. But if anybody is interested in the meantime about, how many of you are working with the blockchain? In there? How many of you, uh, I, don't, I don't know, have uh, thinking about launching a token? <laughs> You're laughing over here. Okay, I see a few hands. 
Okay, just out of curiosity. Yeah, I'm actually starting up a new research project. So if anyone was, you know, is in, involved in this space and in the startups and entrepreneurs around this, please uh, come to me because I would love to learn more. I think my time is up. Do we show the results or how do we? Oh, there I missed them there. Great. Okay. Excellent. Thank you. Permission to facilitate entrepreneurship. Wonderful. Okay, I'm going to take all these down. So keep keep writing. I think that's all for me. Uh, thank you very much. Um, good luck. Yeah, so I guess to the next person. I don't know. <laughs> This is perfect logistics when I get the mic back from the one I gave it to. I, uh, I was part of a research project looking at uh, business models when it comes to uh, how dip, uh, in different ecosystems as IoT enters the ecosystems. And very much, very much focus was uh, when we're looking at IoT, we start realizing the value of data, how data itself can start becoming new products and new values in an offering, your own or another company's offering. So we looked at five or six different ecosystems and saw how new entrants, how big, com uh, big companies uh, position themselves and what IoT solutions really meant when it comes to changing in uh, business models. And one, of, one perspective in order to understand and see the perspective when it comes to how IoT is really changing the, or can change an ecosystem is by thinking about this product. Torque is, uh, is the, uh, for, for um, paper towels and in, in re public restrooms. And the, this product is digitalized. And then the question is, what are you doing with the information that the paper, dispo uh, the paper towels are getting empty? Who are the beneficiary of this information? Is it Torque themselves or SSD or uh, that um, uh, have, get the information to know how much they should produce and uh, to understand the paper production? Is it the facility service like ISS that is uh, producing the, the cleaning in, in, the, in the restrooms? Is it the facility or is it the property or uh, facility management? Or is it the, the building itself? Depending on who you see, think is the beneficiary of this information, you have totally different business models. And it, there is a lot of talk and hope for, from a lot of companies thinking that you're gonna earn money from the data. And if you're thinking about the, this other uh, idea when it comes to home care, you can see that there is a lot of good solutions out there with very good business model each one of them, seeing how you can save money in home care with their product. The problem is that from the municipality point of view, you have 14, 15 different solutions that are not interconnected, which means that if you're gonna have the interface for each one of these, it is, it's really, really expensive and hard to manage when it comes to the municipalities and the home care. And here's the typical point of view that you really do when you're coming as a company. You think about your own product, you think about pushing it out instead of setting it in the context of an ecosystem and seeing how will it ma be managed in the, in the big picture and in, in the ecosystem. And what we did when we looked through these five different areas, uh, we found out there is a couple of questions to ask yourself as you put the perspective, as you look at ecosystems as the whole. And the quest, first question is, of course, what ecosystems are we in? And what are the values created and for who? And the great idea, if you think about small businesses, 
they're normally in multiple ecosystems. One can be the, the main ecosystems, other could be part, uh, ecosystems where they're really just trying to de develop the product or finding other uses that is not the key. So they're just not the key player, they're just an enabler for other services to pursue. Then also, what, and that is very much the focus, of what role is, are you taking? Are you taking the central role or are you just a strategic role? And this is very much the focus, and of course, depending on what kind of role you, you're going to take, also rolls back, get, uh, rolls back to how much money you can earn on your service. And even though you're not the front line, you're not the customer interface, you can be a real strategic role and have a, the major player and earn a lot of money. And then you, of course, have to ask yourself, how mature is your solution? Uh, and is there a need to change the way we're going to do business? Here, I know that Pat, that we're going to follow me, is going to talk about a, bit, a lot about different business models, like software as a uh, different products as a service or offerings as a services, as well as uh, how you enhance your product with digital solutions and so forth. So I'm going to leave that to Pat, but that is also something that we really saw the differences in the, in the different ecosystems. And of course, how are you going to do economies of scale? How are you going to build? How are you going to uh, create a bigger solution from your product? And this is very much what we focus on. And if we take the Mentimeter question, what I would like to ask you is very much based on this, how do you view data? Is it part of your strategy to be open with data and share data, either outbound or inbound? Uh, to provide, so what are, uh, is, do you use data from other companies as part of your offerings? Or do you provide data to other companies to be used in their offerings? Or you build internal just to generate, but not incorporate external data as in your offering? Huh? For uh, Wi-Fi. I'm mm -hmm. It's quite, in, before we, we open up for a discussion around this question, it's quite interesting. If you take, for example, Volvo, uh, uh, trucks. They have, they provide data, they differ where they provide the data uh, uh, to fleet managers. If you're thinking about the American market, they say that the American market is so competitive when it comes to fleet, uh, fleet operators, that they need to provide another kind of serve, uh, data towards the fleet owners in US than they provided in, in Europe in order for them to grasp larger share of the market, larger share of the business in Europe compared to US where they cannot compete with, with the fleet owners that are stronger and more and uh, where they have to take another position. And I think it's quite interesting that uh, 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 one of the big challenges here is very much to go from the green to the other parts. And I think it's quite interesting that we have uh, uh, so many that are using data from other companies as part of, of uh, your offering as such. So that is a little bit of uh, my introduction. I don't know if you want to uh, drive any questions to the audience, Linus? Well, um, um, I, I, I do have a, some thoughts about analytics, but I think I, I want to save that a little bit. Um, yeah. Um, it's not, it's I think not. I think maybe a, uh, maybe a, um, a good question about uh, data is um, now I, I can't ask it as a mentimeter question, so I'll have to to see if I can find a, a volunteer somewhere here in the audience. But I think I think one in, important thing about how to think about data is whether 
the way you think about data has changed in the last two or three years. Because if we look at it, over a very long time period, the primary focus of many organizations has been to sort of sort their internal data, to make internal data work in their enterprise resource planning systems and, and CRM systems and so forth. So the question is, you know, are we at the stage of maturity where we are able to open up? And can we open up in a way where we can also retain control over data quality? So if I, if I sort of start with that more general um, problematization, maybe um, someone can offer uh, some thoughts on, on this uh, dilemma or challenge. Are you at the stage of maturity where you can both open up your data management and retain data quality? We should have a Mentimeter uh, button <laughs> for this, probably. So, okay, so every, if you just nod very, very subtly, you know, in a very <laughs> subdued Swedish way, and then we'll, we'll, we can interpret that as a yes from everyone? No, not yet. Yes, please do. Do you want the, the mic? It's a, know, it's a great mic. Sure. There's, there's another great well, mic. Think, um, I think there are different ways to look at this. Um, the first thing is, I don't think many organizations actually know what data they have or have collect relevant data. And if they collect the data, they're not using it in an appropriate way. So I think there's a long way to go until we actually sort of the data, so to speak, and actually use it in the right sort of way. Yeah, that's interesting. And in a way, you're constantly playing catch up because the data generation of new data, especially with the Internet of Things, means that you have a, an incoming data stream which doubles the, your, your internal exactly, data. Exactly, and that's the data they should be looking at. They don't have the capacity or the competences to do that. But most companies who, say, are listed, for instance, they will look at the BI systems, yeah. and they'll use that kind of data, which yeah. is the thing that supports the whole business, not the behavior right. of the actual Internet of Things things, whatever, right. Scania trucks, or uh, what people actually do, or the client interactions. We yeah. can see that in the startup. So they have a completely different business model, yeah. which starts with, with the client in, in focus, in the center, and you build everything around it, including your data. And then you can use other data, like big data, or you know, text analysis right. or something, and, and add to that. But I think the big challenge is that you know, the client is an afterthought mm -hmm. for the, the listed company where you have your BI systems, it's a self, uh, you know, uh, I don't know, it's, it's like, you know, wheel. It just goes popping and, and the client is somewhere else. And in a way, the BI systems are part of, maybe I'm, I'm, I'm being unfair now, but in a way, they are often used as, a, as part of the old mindset where you have a controlled, stable data set. And they're not used as part of the new mindset where you have continuous data streams that you that you capture and analyze. Well, exactly. Um, just one last point. I think the BI systems of today will tell you whether you go into the direction you said you would. Right. Uh, it's monitoring, basically. It's not evaluation. You're not evalu evaluating whether you're going to the right direction. So that's what the other data can do for you, the big data. Great. Thank you very much. That's very insightful. Um, hey, I see Per up there. Yeah. Great. Yeah. So, uh, but I that means that Stefan just moved. Yeah. So, I think uh, to follow protocol, we need to give Stefan a warm hand, right? I can give uh, two examples of companies that are actually made use of data. We have one representative here, Samuel Arvidsson from the University of Sweden. I'm going to mention you as, a, as an example of a company that's actually been able to use big data and make services from it. Uh, <clears throat> this is the title of chapter number one in the book, and, and my co-author, co Christopher Rosenqvist, and me, what we're doing in this chapter is that we are lining up uh, a set of strategic challenges. We are, I mean, we are putting ourselves in the present, what is happening when it comes to digital transformation in, in different arenas. And we have, in, in the chapter, we have listed 10 
very general strategic challenges and end the chapter also with a set of internal organizational challenges as a result of these more strategic external challenges. Uh, <clears throat> so if we move into uh, what we focus on business. If you look at the uh, word digitalization, which comes up everywhere, if you, there are many different types of, <clears throat> of definitions of this concept, but if we look at one of many, you can see that the word business comes uh, into this sentence three times. So when we talk about digitalization and digital transformation, we are talking about business transformation. <clears throat> And that's what we are focusing on in this chapter. And also I should mention chapter 11. The chapter one, we are focusing very much on the private business, you can say. <clears throat> uh, in chapter 11, we bring in also the public sphere and look at public organizations. And also what is very interesting the, with digitalization, the, uh, <clears throat> the fact that the public and the private spheres are coming closer together. So that's also brought up in, in chapter 11. But here in chapter one, we're focusing on, on, on this. So uh, we're talking about business transformation and business challenges in, in, in this chapter. And we base it, base it on, on cases from these 16 arenas where this is where we're now trying to collect case examples, small and big cases on digital transformation in all these arenas. And when I say arena, that's, uh, there's a purpose with using the word arena. I don't use the word industry here, but because that would be completely wrong. Because one of the <clears throat> things, strategic challenges with digitalization is the fact that we see the, uh, how industrial boundaries dissolve with digitalization. Uh, the connected vehicle here, the connected car, for example, telecom and automotive coming together. Uh, pharma beyond the pill over there, <coughs> pharmaceuticals and food industry coming together, often with digital platforms as, as a basic uh, foundation. Uh, in the smart cities examples uh, and in other examples, we have the public and the private sectors coming closer and closer together. So this is one of the strategic challenges that we are, are uh, listing in this chapter and discussing. Uh, <clears throat> just to um, say, uh, summarize what we're doing in the chapter then, uh, we line up 10 strategic challenges and connected to the economic aspects, to technology, uh, to uh, uh, customers, partnerships, and so on. And it ends up with seven inter internal organizational challenges associated with that. Uh, when we do these cases, one concept comes up all the time. And it comes up in, in more than one of these 10 external strategic challenges. And I can guess that you know what word I'm, I'm, <coughs> I'm trying to referring to. Business models. So this comes up and it comes up in different shapes in these interviews in when we interview managers sort of representing these 16 arenas. They talk about the fact that during this transition, this digital transformation, we need to work with dual business models in parallel uh, we need to find a more uh, um, scalable business model. Uh, we need to change certain parts of our business model. Very many talk about one particular part of the business model, that is the revenue model. We need to experiment and find new revenue streams, new revenue models. So you can say that this seems to be a common challenge across all these 16 sectors. Uh, to give you some examples of, of uh, business model challenges, uh, <clears throat> these three cases we worked with during uh, the fall of 2017. So the first one is Getinge. Getinge provides uh, <clears throat> medical uh, equipment to intensive care in hospitals. They put a machine in an intensive care wardroom and beside Getinge's machine, and I should say right away, this machine generates a lot of big data about the patient, about the machines, and so on. Uh, but beside Getinge's machine, you have a machine from Siemens, you have a machine from Philips, you have a machine from General Electric, and also from other big manufacturers. And the doctors <clears throat> that takes the decision about the patient, they need data from all these machines. So the question is for Getinge, of course, they say, how can we make new business from this 
data generated from these uh, our machines. Well, maybe we need to think about some kind of cooperation done with our, you can say, competitors. They, they are also sort of competing with these machines. They're both complementary, but also competing. So how do we do that? What kind of business model should we have? And what kind of technological platform should we have? Because this is the first time that this idea has come up. Create new services for the doctors taking decisions based on, on this uh, big data. Uh, the second example, Nobina, uh, public transportation. In the western part of Sweden, uh, the, the, the county, uh, <coughs> the authorities there have said that, well, maybe we should look at the citizens' whole sort of uh, traveling uh, needs, not only the bus lines. Uh, so now Nobina is challenged by the fact that the, the customers, they want to go towards mobility as a service for their citizens not bus traffic versus train traffic and so on. And of course, this is also a technological question. What kind of platform should we have to sort of handle that? And how should one of the actors, Nobina, act here? Should they join sort of rental bike firms or what, what should they do? Sort of turning bus tickets into mobility as a service. And then thirdly, and there we have Samuel here representing Universal Music, uh, big data. Uh, big listener data from Spotify, what can you use that for? Well, you can use it to change your business model. That is, two parts of the business model, especially how we understand the customers. Uh, with the help of big data, we can now sort of segment the listeners in different ways. And as a second step, we can also change the offering of the business model, the offering to these new segments by sort of having another type of product design around the, the artist. So that's, you can say, two parts of the business model can be changed with the help of um, <coughs> big data analysis. So three examples. So uh, I also want to do like Robin, I want to take you up and do some research here. I mean, I, I know that many of you are probably representing or in, in the middle of some kind of uh, digital transformation here. So I, I want to <coughs> know, when you say that Business models is the big challenge here. What, what do you actually mean? What part of the business model? Is it the whole business model? Stefano said that I have a two complex questions. I'm going to help you. <laughs> okay. So, is it about the money? Is it the revenue model? Is it the financial part of the business model? That is the tricky thing here with digitalization. Is it the customer segment? That is the most tricky thing. That is, we're coming closer to the customers with digitalization because the customers are also digitalized. Uh, and the shared economy is one example of where the, pressure comes, where the pressure comes much more from the customers. Is it the offering uh, that is the problem? But maybe going more towards services, pure services. Uh, is this the composition of the whole model? That is, do we need to change certain parts of the business model or the whole business model so we can transfer it to new markets in a more simple way, making it more scalable rather than adaptable? Uh, is it the infrastructure? Everybody's talking about the challenges of business model connected to cooperation. Do we need to cooperate across new sort of industry boundaries? Is that the part of the business model that is the tricky thing here. Or maybe we need to move into the organization. Is, it, is the business model problem rather an internal problem that we don't have the right processes to actually experiment with the business model? Experiment, which is much simpler now with digitalization. Is it, is it more of an internal organizational issue, this business model challenge? Or is it something else? That's my question. Very interesting. I hadn't expected internal processes to be the tricky thing here. Okay, Samuel, can I pose the question to you? Sure. Yeah. Do you see that this is as an internal sort of challenge with business model development at Universal Music Sweden? 
Can you hear me? Oh, yeah. yeah. Um, I think that the difficulties for at least uh, us historically and, you know, kind of now is, um, first of all, that, you know, of course, there's a bunch of data coming in, mm -hmm. but also that artists are artists and they are artists and they, you know, have a different mindset and they should have a different mindset. And we're trying to merge their expectations and their wishes and their dreams and their, you know, mm -hmm. Um, aspirations uh, to fold it into like this big data and and without actually interfering with the kind of like the artistry uh, because it's super important that they remain on the creative edge while they still trying to adhere to some kind of um, I'm gonna say an, an actual reality mm -hmm. uh, I'm just gonna assume that the, the data you know that we get is, is the reality because previously they were in a position where they can just say, well, I think, I think my fans want this. And, as, and the artists are still at a point where their artistic um, um, kind of instinct is, you know, it's, it, it's, it absolutely needs to be there. Mm. But we also guide them, um, you know, when we can and when they are open to it and say, hey, your fans and your, you know, where you want to go and to the audience that you want to reach, you need to make a few changes. So it could be everything from, you know, maybe you should uh, enhance a certain part of your brand. M maybe you should downplay something else. Maybe you need to change the music, not like in a big way, but you need to tweak it mm -hmm. in order to achieve the biggest success. Okay. Any other comments on the internal? What are the internal sort of challenges here? What, what kind of problems are there or inertia in the organization when it comes to business modeling processes? Yeah. With internal processes. So yeah. what we see is that the traditional business models, like the, how the organization is organized, mm -hmm. the hierarchical structures, they are not managing in the new digital era. Mm -hmm. Simply, uh, the di digitalization means that the people need to make decisions on the place, mm -hmm. and you are the boss. So you also need to reorganize, to create the, um, uh, a new culture based on empowerment, mm -hmm. based on authority, etc., etc. And not all organizations are there yet. Mm -hmm. In Sweden, many organizations are already there. Mm -hmm but not uh, internationally. Hmm? Okay, so we have a research area here, I think. <coughs> Internal Sorry? organization and business modeling. Uh, so uh, I didn't hear the beginning we of the question. We have a new research area here. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Um, I was kind of thinking that we should know this. Uh, because <laughs> okay well not well you <laughs> should know this yeah. Yeah. Uh, I was uh, more broadly because <coughs> you know we've been using information technology to change the workplace for more than mm. 50 years mm. and so we should know a lot about organizational change involving technology mm. uh, so to me this is also very interesting mm. um, because obviously we're, this is something that has to be a type of skill that has to be reacquired and reinvented for in, in, mm. when there's a new cycle of change coming. Mm. Um, so definitely, yep. we have some some new cool yep. stuff to do. Maybe we hear more about some internal issues here coming let's, up. Let's let's do that. Yeah. Can I question. just ask one question? Yeah. Can somebody say what they wrote? What the other what what are other business model challenges? Can somebody give an example, please? Twenty one people out there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> 21 people guilty of, of uh, ticking that box, so now it's up to, or not. Oh, I'm so curious. <laughs> <laughs> Give us something. No? You can come and tell me after the break, after the break okay? We, <laughs> we, we solicit s s secret <laughs> conversations. Yeah, uh, yeah. Absolutely. Oh, oh, there. Oh, there. Oh, great. oh, great. Here's a mic. Um, Krista Strangquist from SET, the company with the Torque Easy Cube example that was just there. So one of the challenges we face there is actually that we're overtaking our own customers, going directly towards the end customer, which in our case would be the facility managers who are overstepping the distributors. So that's of course a challenge to, to manage. 
Thank you very much. So, so this, this, this intermediation, if you will, or, or changing industry structure. Yes, great. Now, you're, you're, you're gaining good yeah. courage here. Yeah. Massimo Moreschini. Now, it's, for my point of view, it's not mentioned here, uh, for example, the regulamentation, the external law, that maybe are not fast enough to follow in the, business, the new business model. And this is more complex stuff, because if you don't have the law that supports you to this new business model, then you are not able to apply. So and maybe the government, not only is winning, are not uh, at the same speed that uh, the digital gesture. So legal frameworks uh, lagging behind. Yeah. yeah, very good point, very important point. Okay, anything else? Okay, Frida, over to you. Okay, so good evening, everyone. Um, thank you for this. This is an excellent link to what I'm going to talk about now, the internal organization processes. Because as you all know, working with digital transformation is not just about the digital part, it's really about the transformation. And that is about people inside organizations. And all of you sitting in here are parts of organizations, and you know that your organizations have a legacy. Even if you're a startup, you have some sort of legacy and you have to work with that to transform. Right, so I'm going to talk about digitalization of expertise because this is one part that we think is going to drive some of the changes in the companies in the years to come. And I would like to start with a statement, so you can see this. Basically saying that digitalization is going to change what we see as valuable expertise. What kind of expertise are you willing to buy? What kind of expertise are you willing to invest in, like in education, internal training, and so on? What kind of expertise will be valuable in the future? And we have some ideas already from Robin's part, right? What we see in the future, very much related to humans and the, the parts of being interacting in, in society. So we think that this is going to change how we organize companies. It's also going to change the role of the experts. And I think we have many experts here in the room today you might be working in companies providing expert services or you're just senior people with lots of experience, lots of knowledge, and lots of ideas. And this is going to change. So what we're doing is that we're starting a new research project. And this project, we're interested in how organizations are going to change as digitalization pushes the frontier of what is expertise. How is the man-machine division of work going to look like? What kind of expertise is going to be needed from humans? What kind of expertise can the machines provide us with? All of today we see lots of examples of highly intelligent machines providing creative solutions, helping us in decision making, judgments, etc. Things that we thought were purely human. So what's going to happen? And we're really interested in what's going on inside the companies. So what kind of approaches are you going to take to manage this transformation? And more precisely, what kind of work processes are needed when you change this? What kind of human relations are needed? And also, what is this going to have, what kind of impact is this going to have on the career paths inside companies? Or that today we see patterns in highly knowledge intensive companies that used to be populated by, for example, lawyers or, or um, people in this school or other types of experts. And now we can see that they are developing new career paths for people with a more technological engineering background, data scientists, for example. So that's interesting. And we can also see that this is go probably going to change the work identities, because if a machine can do much of the work that I used to do as an expert, then what is left for me? What will I build my work identity on? And we can also see some challenges already today in companies who have started to use new types of technology for to automate, for example, standardized routine tasks that we used to have the juniors doing, working late nights with Excel sheets and so on, or working through documents, writing reports, whatever. This kind of tasks are now becoming automated to a large extent. And what's happened, hap is happening then is that these junior people don't really have that kind of training anymore. So what are the juniors going to do? Not everyone can become a senior at once have to have, get some experience. So how can we organize for that? How can we make use of the junior people and give them the training that they need? 
and it also gave the people who wanted to have in Chile the change that they need. Another part of this project is to look at different types of companies, both the incumbents who wanted to have well-functioning well processes, we can have a strong brand name, we can have a very well-functioning well career plan and so on. How are they going to change? And also, what are the new, uh, new sorry, the new companies going to do, the new pioneers, the startups, but the, the kind of companies that already have a technological platform to build on, so the digital natives. Are they going to work together, like in collaboration? Are they going to be competitors? Or are they going to be complements to each other? This varies quite a lot, and in the industry, and also depending on who you talk to. What we can see in this, um, in one of our studies that we have done so far, and we can also read about it in the book, one of the chapters, is that this has taken some, has gone quite far in the legal industry. And we would say that the legal industry is uh, quite conservative or traditional, but still we see that a lot of new companies have emerged that are more virtually based. They have networks of lawyers that are just grouped together via a technological platform. They're sitting out anywhere in the, in the, around the globe. But we can also see other types of companies where they have an automated solution. So they can provide automated solutions to the clients for a much lower price. So what they're doing is a sort of unbundling the legal services, carving out the niche in the market. And some firms that we talk to say that, well, this is really a, a problem for us. They're competing with us. They're taking away uh, parts of our business, and this is leading to price pressure for us. Whereas other of the incumbents say that, well, let them do that. That's not part of our business. It's not a threat to us. And a third group of companies say, well, we're trying to partner up with these companies to make sure that we can really use their technology to our advantage as well. So there are different ways of dealing with this, but we don't really know yet how to do this. And again, we think it has a lot of things, a lot to do with what you see as relevant and important knowledge and expertise in the company. And this is going to change. So I would like to ask a few questions to you. First of all, what kind of approach do you have to digital transformation in your company? Perhaps you have decided on having a very centralized, top-down approach that we can see in some companies. Or perhaps you've gone the other way and said, no, let's have a more emergent, uh, decentralized approach. We're going to let the different functions internally develop their own solutions, and then we'll see what happens. Or perhaps you're trying to, to establish or already have a lab or a hub that is separated, where you can experiment and innovate and so on. Or perhaps you don't really know yet. Perhaps I haven't decided. Mm -hmm. Does it surprise you, the numbers that you can see so far? I think this is pretty much what we could expect. Many companies are used in the top-down approach. What I think is interesting here is the I don't know stable. Because we shouldn't forget about them, right? Not everyone has a plan. It's very easy to, to think that well, everyone knows exactly what to do. We have a great plan. But lots of, lots of companies are still thinking or trying to decide or haven't really communicated what the plan is. So I think that's a really, really interesting stable. We can also see the idea of creating a separate lab or a hub has become really, really popular the last years. And this can work really well. But then, of course, you have the challenge of how do you sort of link the hub together with the, the, the original companies, let's say. How can you make sure that you really can leverage the solutions, ideas that you get from the lab and bring it back to the company and vice versa? How can you learn from each other? Yeah. Excellent. I think we can move on to the next question. Is that okay? Yeah. Then let's do that. So if you are an incumbent, perhaps you know that there are startups or other companies trying to establish themselves in your industry. How do you regard them? Do you think that they are your competitors? Or do you, are they complements to you? Or are they people that you would like to collaborate with, partner up with? Or perhaps you don't know. And if you are a startup, how do you view yourself? Do you see yourself as a competitor or complement or a collaborator? 
or perhaps having really thought about it. So this is quite interesting. It's quite even between the competitors and the collaborators. But what if you see it as a compliment? Is there anyone here who has uh, voted for the collaborator who would like to share what you do and how you, how you work together? We'll take it on later on. Yeah. So, do you have any other comments or questions? I think Stefan is moving on. I think. No? Okay. Thank you. Am I on? Okay, so um, Stefan, you're the timekeeper. How much time do I have? One minute or five or ten? That's fantastic. Otherwise, I have the short version, which is. Uh, uh, thank you. I can give you the short version for, first. Um, the question really here is uh, uh, how are companies actually doing in terms of creating value from digitalization initiatives? and. Uh, Together with uh, um, Carl Wenberg and Robert Demir, Carl is at the Handels and at Lean Shipping, and Robert is at Lancaster. Uh, we um, asked uh, by survey around 1,200 uh, Swedish manufacturing companies, and uh, we got rough, roughly 200 answers, which is which is pretty good uh, for a survey. Um, so the short short question and answer is. Uh, are we walking the talk in terms of our di digitalization initiatives? And uh, the short answer is so-so, um, not quite. So it seems that we, are, we, we have higher ambitions than we can actually follow through on. And um, I'll talk a little bit more about this. Um, what we did, what we asked about was a range of questions related to uh, um, how do you work with digital initiatives? What's the focus of your, of your uh, um, what is the primary focus of the initiatives you're pursuing? What are you planning to do in the next two years, et cetera, et cetera. And I, I thought I, I, I'm not gonna show a lot of slides because uh, obviously you're gonna get the book and you're gonna have a reason to read the book. So um, there are some nice uh, graphs here that you can uh, take a look at to see uh, exactly how uh, other manufacturing firms have answered. But I'll give you sort of the executive summary. And um, the first thing we notice is that uh, looking at these firms, we see clearly laggards and leaders. So there is, there is a, a sort of a, um, there's an empty middle, or not entirely empty, but there's clearly one set of companies that are lagging behind and one set of companies that have advanced further. And it does seem like the smaller companies are having, are struggling more to keep up. Um, that's the first, uh, first observation. The second observation really uh, relates to one of the previous questions here about the internal processes. Um, we saw a, a, a pretty strong focus on internal processes over other types of digitalization initiatives. And that, that, that connects very well to the question that Per asked earlier about what are the challenges in the business model. So it seems like of the companies, one interpretation is that they're acting in the way that you actually indicated here, namely that the internal processes are a major challenge and that needs to be addressed. Um, however, we are also a little bit concerned about the balancing of efforts because what we're seeing is a lot more focus on process improvements and a lot less on products and services. And uh, we're concerned about that that means that there, is, um, um, that there is a lot of potential in terms of digitalizing products and services or turning products into services 
that is not currently not being pursued uh, or not being pursued as vigorously as internal improvements. Um, furthermore, we also found that the area where there is less activity even than in the product or service area is in terms of analytics. And um, um, so that means that if we're looking at what are, what are companies doing, they're doing the stuff they used to be doing, namely process improvement. They're doing less in products and services and they're doing, at least in our sample, even less in, analy in analytics. So our concern here is that we're really looking at relatively conservative change behavior. I'm, I'm sort of looking in your, in, in your direction, Per, right? Yeah. So I know that uh, I, Stefan told me that you work a lot with uh, analytics uh, challenges. So I'd actually, I'd like to throw, throw you a question if this is something that jives with your experience that there seems to be a hurdle in terms of um, um, getting companies to, to um, address the analytics challenge. Yeah, uh, thank you, Magnus. Uh, I'm working a lot. I'm from a consulting firm. I'm running analytics for Nordics with this consulting firm. And we have a lot of experience working across the industry and supporting companies to build their own data science pools and analytics organizations. And we see, of course, a lack of competence in the market. And if you look at the you know, the future, it will be even worse. Yeah. I think there is a, there will be a war for talent in this area. That's the number one. I think maybe one relief could be that AI will take over some of the data science type of work, but then you need to actually be in control and maybe do other things, uh, which the STEM kind of capability will. Exactly. So then you need that talent, right? Yes. So there will be a war of talent for this, but I think many companies have problems to find the real kind of value for drivers here. There is a crossroad that even, even if you know exactly what you want to do, you need to find a business case and a use case. You need to start in the, with the end in mind and think about that. What kind of data you need to make the impact and what kind of uh, use case you need to have. And the data, to make data work in the company, you need to have the data science pool in order to take the, the models and the, uh, the base tables to the right level, right? Many companies are trying to trim their organizations, but the, the size of the, uh, so to say, value is not big enough. And that is one of the problems. How do you scale it up to make the business use, uh, the business uh, stakeholders to, to adopt it? And then there is a crossroad. Even if you do that, you also need to have an innovation pool of, um, of people who can actually take the data in the, uh, in the uh, data lake or whatever you have and try innovation on that data without having a kind of uh, end in mind uh, uh, hypothesis. Uh, so there are two different ways of uh, going about it. And in mind, then you have already uh, the expectation of the value. And of course, if you do innovation, you can do big things, but you can also lose a lot of time. Yeah. Thank you. That's very, uh, that's very interesting. So what's kind of interesting, especially I think is what you're pointing to is, is um, uh, initial investment, and the need for slack resources and the need for, for very qualified expertise to even start doing things. And that would explain, of course, where, why small companies are going to risk being behind on this. I think we have one more comment here. Same role, uh, we're working on process efficiency here as well. I was actually gonna ask you since we're sitting so close. Uh, so my question or, or idea really is more about there's a disconnect between the people coming out of business schools which are not fundamentally trained in analytics or statistics at all, which makes it really hard to apply these concepts, whereas you have a, a vast number of people coming out of, of sort of natural sciences, uh, medicine for example, where I think we'll see a migrating stream of newly minted PhDs moving from universities and abandoning their careers to go into business to sort of fill this talent gap. Because I think that the interesting thing about the analytics revolution is the fact that how to work with statistics is not exactly a new science. It's in fact very well known, but it's just very scarce to find those people if you look in the ordinary pools 
uh, from what I understand, the Stockholm School of Economics doesn't really offer really, really strong analytics um, intermingled with business kind of education, does it? And, and few other schools do. Yeah, it pains me to, to, uh, to give you, uh, uh, to say you're right on that. Uh, we do have a lot of quantitative skills, but they're usually more focused uh, than broadly um, applicable to a range of analytics uh, topics. So you're at least partly right. So, uh, and, and obviously knowing the industry, uh, a lot of business schools are doing exactly what you're saying, trying to catch up on this. Um, I, I think you're also right in the fact that there's a, there's a big pull for talent from STEM education and from PhD programs in the STEM area. Um, so it's, it's definitely an important, uh, um, important topic. And I think it really connects back to the uh, expertise shortage. So that's kind of interesting in relation to your uh, topic, Frida, that you know, in order to automate and um, to automate expertise, you need a new kind of expertise, which is also scarce. So uh, it'd be interesting to follow this stuff on. Yeah. Okay, great. So um, let me just, um, so I, I guess what we're doing in our chapter is we're partly raising the question, are companies being too conservative, right? And we don't know the, uh, uh, the answer there. What we do know is that uh, we see push from the customers. If you're lucky, your company is being pushed by the customers to be more innovative. We see some push from boards and from owners. Uh, our concern there is that, um, not sure this works. Okay, cool. So our concern here is uh, really, is there enough happening in terms of push from, from uh, boards and executive teams? So what I'd like you to answer is, um, are the expectations ambitious and demanding in, in terms of what comes from the message from the boards and, and executive teams in your companies and organizations. Okay, I'm going to I'm going to assume that that's going to be stable unless we have lots of innovation heavy companies who are paradoxically very late in answering answering the question. Uh, so it's a so-so answer, right? Okay, let's let's uh, unless someone really becomes very upset with me, I'm going to actually move on to the next question, which is. Um, Boards and executive teams have the necessary knowledge and insights to guide digital innovation and transformation efforts. So right now the, the lever here says, well, it can't really be that bad. So it, it jumps up 0.10%. 10%. I'm not that surprised. I actually, I, pu I published a paper last year called Supervising Projects You Don't Understand. Uh, and uh, so that should get more readership, I guess. Um, I'm not at all surprised. I think there is, I, I actually was expecting that to be a lot of push but not a lot of guidance. I think that's the situation. And that's a typical situation when you're early in a transformation phase, right? We know this is important. We don't really know how to do it. Let's see if, if the skills are there. So that's the last question. We have the skill sets and work practices we need to succeed. This is almost uh, sort of the, the most important question in a way.
in. So not, not surprising either, right? We're, that's the situation we're in right now, and that's, part, that's one major part of this challenge. Uh, it's really very much a, a, a knowledge-dependent revolution. And, uh, you know, some people say, we have all the technology. The technology is not what keeps us at bay. It's really the creativity, the stuff you talked about earlier, the creativity, all the knowledge and skills and competencies and understanding from philosophy to analytics and everything in between that we need to, to uh, capture hardness and leverage in order to get things moving faster. Um, I'm, I'm curious about this end. I know we're gonna wrap, but I'd, I'd love to, ha to hear from someone on this end. If you dare, Because if, if there's someone here who sa dares to say something about what brought them here, then, you know, we can collectively probably save uh, uh, years or decades in, in uh, futile development work by just listening to you for one minute. Okay, that's going to be one of our secret conversations too, I think. So uh, thank you very much. And with that, I'm, I'm handing over to... Am I handing over to you, Stefan? Okay, great. So who's next? Petronella is next. Great. Do you want my mic? Wonderful. Here you go. Thank you. Thank you. Let's see how this works. So thank you. Let's see if this works. Yes? Great. Okay, great. So my name is Petronella Andersen. I work at Executive Education, and uh, we are part of this team organizing this evening. So together with SSC, MPC, we're one of the organizers. And I have the honor to say a couple of words in the end of this evening. So first, uh, I want to thank all, every, each one of you coming here tonight, here at SSC, that uh, actually is the place where things happen, actually, well, tonight, anyway. So thank you so much coming here. We, we're so happy working, being that bridge between science, all of these experts that we can bring, be that bridge between science and practice. Practice is important for science, and science is important for practice. Neither one of them can live with the other one, right? Can live, can, can live without the other one, of course. <laughs> yeah, sometimes I do things wrong, me too, yeah. Actually, I want to share with you, yesterday morning, I was up in our office here in, in, in SSC. We have an office in fifth floor. You should come there sometime. We have a great lounge, good coffee too, so you can pass by if you want to. I was up there preparing for a webinar, and webinars really make me nervous. Why is that? I mean, now that it's down to practice in digitalization, right? So I'm very happy talking with groups, but when it comes to webinars, my heart starts pumping like that, and I feel nervous, starting sweating. So why is that? Of course, it's the virtual distance that makes me a little bit uncomfortable. So. What did I do then? I called for a friend. That's usually what I do. So I called for my friend Molly and said, please, can you help me? I need some advice here. So she's fantastic in, in organizing things, putting the right questions, so, so, so she coached me. And the other thing, of course, I needed tech, technical advice. So we have a guy named Richard. He's really one of these pioneers that we talked about earlier, right? So he's constantly innovating. And now he has reconstructed the whole studio. It's more like a spaceship, something like that, in a very small room in Exit. You should come there also, by the way. Come and have a look at the small spaceship. Anyhow, he has actually redone the whole studio now. So now I can see all the participants live. Of course, you think, might think, that's well, we do that every day. But I haven't had that technology before. And this webinar, me being connected in a totally different way, I can see them all. I can 
make that distance a little bit smaller and be able to notice the movements, the small smiles and nodding and questions. So the webinar was actually, I didn't need to be that nervous, but thanks to you, Molly and Richard and all the crew up there, the webinar was fantastic. It was actually also inspired by you, Robin, after your lecture for that group, 25, 20 managers from a big organization, and they work with future scenarios. Very hard to know what happens in the future. So they really enjoyed working cross in the organization to talk about the future. We don't know anything about the future, right? But we need to develop our skills in scenario thinking. So how might the future be then if we don't know? We need to enhance our capability or competence in scenario thinking. That's one observation that we do and that we take with us. Another thing is, of course, we need to stay curious, constantly stay curious, and to test. And we need not to be afraid of testing. We need to test whatever mentee, we need to test these things. How does it work? And we need to learn together and share our learnings. Because we don't know what we don't know, if we don't try it, we will never understand how it works. So courage is also important. And also, as all of you know, to have courage in an organization, we need to have a culture of trust. Yeah, you win. I know that. So, a couple of observations. Knowledge is important, yes. Culture is also important. Leadership, great leaders, to lead this in a constantly changing world. An unsecure future. We don't know anything about it. Well, as you understand, our job here at SSC and Exit and M MTC is very rewarding and it's very inspiring and meaningful for us to do these kind of things, bring the science out to you and listen to you, practice. And to say, I don't, I'm not going to talk so much more, but we would like to bring all the, the speakers up to the stage, please. Robin, Frida, Magnus and Per, please come up to the stage and give you a big applause. Thank you so much. We have flowers. You will have flowers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Real flowers, not digital flowers. <laughs> not digital ones. I'll start with Robin. Thank you so much. And flowers for Frida. It goes first. Thank you so much. And of course, the guys too. Yes. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yes. Thank you so much. Thank you. A big applause to the success. Thank you so much. <laughs> and of course, as in, in all these occasions, there are always a crew, right? A group of people having worked a lot to make this evening come true. So I would like to thank all of the guys, the crew that's organizing this evening in this very fantastic way. And as I said, thanks to you too. If you want to continue to discuss how do we take this further in our organization, what kind of help can we get, please do not hesitate. We will continue to have discussions outside, sharing and networking, and a warm hand to everybody. Right. Okay, thank you. Thank you.